the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 75. Today we are going to be talking about adventure in board games, the idea of adventure. As always, my name is Mark, here with me today by my side is Amber. Hi everyone! And then in their various other houses we've got Ben. Hello! And Matt. How do you know that I'm in my house? That's a fair point. You have some <laughs> weird Skype background on. But there was a blanket, Matt. There was he a blanket. He could be anywhere. Only blankets true. only blankets exist in away. Blankets are portable. It's true. Well, I'm in my house. <laughs> <laughs> or Thank is that for... just what he wants us to think? He was behind us the whole time. I Anyways, mean... we got a full we had a full group. This is the first time in a while. Last three since yeah. the semi-official reboot were just uh, me and Orion. Uh, Orion has moved a thousand miles away, and uh, now we got other people here. Not that Orion won't be on future podcasts. There is technology. Yeah, uh, he better be. He has all the technology. Yeah. So, what's it like? How's it? How's it feel to be back on? It's good. Matt's looking lost there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, I mean, this it's it's been it's been a crazy year for everyone um i've certainly played fewer board games since i stopped coming to board game night but we, we've managed to do some so yeah I, I, as we, we were talking earlier i played like an excessive amount of magic the gathering over the last year so hopefully i, I don't get become too obnoxious with uh that that being my board game examples <laughs> i've actually played probably less magic the gathering in 2020 than i did in 2019 I, I diversified yeah. more, uh, which is, I don't know. And then Amber's here to uh, surprise and, and shock us. It's been a while. I haven't played very many games, but I've played some, and I like the topic. Amber, you get the most positive feedback of anyone ever who is on the podcast. It's because... Every single time you're on, people want more of you. But that's because I'm only on a few times. Oh, I see. So my voice has more... They even want more. It, it's just more special. Yeah, it's a strategy. Mm-hmm. Anyways, we're here to well, talk about... Well, by that more... logic, I, I should get tons of praise for today, so... <laughs> well, I don't know what the it. praise is going to be like for today. Leave a comment below. Who's your favorite person? <laughs> it's a popularity <laughs> contest. Hit now, us man. against each other. It's That's on. the real reason for the podcast. Good. Anyways, we're talking about adventure in board games today, uh, which is a topic that I added to the list after Orion and I played Space Corp, uh, 2025 to 2300 AD, the subtitle, um, from GMT, which honestly I think is super underrated, uh, but it ignited in us a tremendous sense of adventure, I think more than maybe any other game I've played. Uh, and so, of course, I brought on people who haven't played that. Actually, wait, Ben, did you play with us? I okay, did. Yeah, once. Ben played once with us. Anyways, but it, it got me thinking about this idea of adventure, because we have um, in board games a lot of very adventuresome themes or settings, I might say. Uh, so lots of science fiction, lots of fantasy uh, those lend themselves to adventure in other media, right? Fantasy books are often filled with adventure, sci-fi books. Um, that's kind of their hallmark. But in board gaming, it seems like a harder thing to tap into. You can certainly get it with RPGs, but with board games, it seems a bit more challenging. So I wanted to dive into that and get a discussion about where we see adventure in board gaming, if at all, and how, as hypothetical designers, we may tap into that. What kind of things in board games I uh, tap into adventure. Um, so I want to throw it out to you all. To you, just blindly hearing the word adventure in the context of board gaming, uh, are there any particular games that stand out or any ideas of what adventure means to you in this context? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll um, start off. I, I think we, you, ta- you mentioned RPGs a little bit, and I think dungeon crawlers are kind of the RPG stand-in for board games like Gloomhaven or Imperial Assault or Descent. 
Um, so I think those definitely have adventure as at least a an intended part of the gameplay experience. Whether or not it actually carries it off all that well is another question. That that was kind of the first thing that I thought of. When I think of adventure games, I don't necessarily think of a particular game, but I like it when I can take a move in a game that feels big and bold and creative, where I'm not pigeonholed into a certain set of moves that is expected, um, and it feels like it impacts my own personal journey and story within the game and helps me to conquer and win. Um, so... It, Those are just the feelings and the ideas that that evokes. I don't know that there is a board game where I I would say I'm able to do that as much as I want. Um, I I do want that out of a lot more more games. I think Twilight Imperium is a good example. Um, Again, I want to be able to make bigger moves in that game and find myself not being able to, so it kind of hampers the adventure aspect a little bit. Um, But I do feel that in that game... I am building an, a, a galactic empire of my own and spreading, and I'm able to make big, bold moves and choices um, that don't necessarily mirror what everyone else is doing in the game. Uh, and so I think that exemplifies adventure. And then, of course, theme always helps. It helps if you have a theme that enables exploration and conquering. Um, it, I don't think that the theme it necessarily makes or breaks the game, I don't think it necessarily like defines a game as an adventure game or not, but it, I think it plays into it um, as long as the mechanisms allow for that kind of gameplay. That's an interesting take on what adventure means, because that's not where my mind goes when I think about it, but it makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. The idea of having a large amount of agency in the game as adventure, uh, combined with other factors... I suppose it makes sense, though my when I was thinking about what does adventure mean and where do we see it in board games, I always came back to the idea of exploration and surprise. And a Mm, game that has a wide possibility space for your actions doesn't necessarily have those things. So, for instance... On one extreme, you have, like, Go, which has an enormous possibility space. But, but... But but has no real setting or theme to it. And you're doing the same actions. You're placing a piece. So I understand the options for placing that piece are endless, and the strategy is endless. But in the end, you're doing the exact same thing as the other player. Gotcha. So Which you're I think looking, is the opposite. You're thinking of big choices as, as a variety of different strategies you can pursue. Uh, but, but in Go, you're pursuing different strategies, too. So I don't I don't know if that accurately narrows down what I'm talking about. Maybe I lack... Or maybe a, a feeling of being able to go on different paths. I think feeling has a lot has a lot to do with it, with the way I'm viewing adventure. I want to be able to feel that I am moving forward, doing what I want to do in a bold and creative way. Yeah, I I see that. So, I mean, the biggest sense of adventure you'd get out of games would be the more sandboxy they are, right? The more freeform, like I've heard, I haven't played it yet. I've always wanted to play it, uh, but there's a game called Zia Legends of a, or Zia Legends of a Drift System, which is supposed to be very, very sandboxy. There's just like certain, you can just pursue a certain aspect of the game and ignore a whole bunch of others. And it sounds like that's the kind of game you would get the most adventure feeling out of maybe maybe um i don't necessarily think it has to be that sandboxy in order to be an adventure game but i think it helps and i think that type of game it definitely is more likely to have that adventure feel um the way i'm defining it actually i i really agree that it doesn't have to be um sandboxy my my initial reaction was that it's um, adventure in board games it is a more kind of evocative thing. It, like it, it's 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 something that you you kind of feel based on what you you're looking at more so than some a lot of the um, maybe other ways we've looked at board games. You said exploration and surprise, Mark. I think for me, surprise is huge. 
when I think of adventure, I think of a, a feeling of what's going to come next, whether that be, and usually in, in kind of that uh, quote unquote theme kind of way, more so than uh, mechanic or decision based. So yeah, I'd almost say that adventure for me is more tied to kind of the external things, the artwork, and, and perhaps other more external things than, say, like narrative in board gaming, which would be way more tied to how the game actually plays out. Yeah, and I'm thinking, like, for me, I think the difference between adventure and narrative might be... An example might be the difference between rolling dice and flipping a card over. There's something about flipping a card or a tile or something over that feels more adventuresome than rolling dice. Even though yeah. they're both both random, there's something about like 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 in Space yeah, Corp. I agree. In Space Corp, the adventure you get is that you have all these you start each of the of the three sections or phases of the game with a number of tiles face down on the board. And as you travel uh, and explore space and go further out, uh, you get to flip over those tiles and see what's on the different systems or, or moons or whatever. I think that feels like adventure to me. And I think if there was, for instance, a, uh, a die roll when you entered a space in like a results table, it would feel significantly less adventuresome. I think there's something about discovering something that's already there that kind of makes it feel more like an adventure, even even though there's no practical difference, uh, just kind of having the foreknowledge that, okay, here is something that will be revealed instead of, you know, okay, well, we're going to roll a die and figure out what's going on there. I, I think that's a, a good distinction to make. Yeah. It, it, I, I, was, I was thinking the about world, The world is out there. We just haven't. Yeah, but, we just haven't uncovered all the nooks and cranny of the world yet. Yeah, I love that, and I agree with everything. But I think there has to be some kind of action component to it, and so I think the mechanics of the gameplay do come into this. Um, can we talk about specific games? Of course, because yeah. the one that immediately came to mind for this podcast as something that most people would consider to be an adventure game is the Above and Below and Near and Far <laughs> series, right? And Mm -hmm. Those games, I wanted to love them, and I still like them as a fun group group game or group activity at some points, but they have all of those theme components. They have the exploration, the surprise, they have the narrative, but I think what they really lacked was player agency and action, because all you're doing in the game is going down into the caves, you have a certain number of moves, you're doing the same thing as other players, and there doesn't seem to be a real... Uh, strategic component other than gathering these components, which feels very much like, like, like a Euro game almost. Well, I mean, they are Euro games. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I think that the, dis the difference between Above and Below and Near Far is interesting to consider mm -hmm. because Above and Below, its adventure system is very much just one of many different mechanisms in the game. And so you get these little nuggets of narrative, but they're disconnected. They're mm -hmm. just like little tiny bits thrown in there, here and there. Otherwise, you're playing basically just like a, a, a Euro game. In Near and Far, it Lockett very much tries to create a more coherent narrative, but it sacrifices actual agency and choice in yeah. the gameplay because it pushes you towards doing the things to unlock your narrative so hard that everyone just kind of rushes towards that, and then you kind of sort out everything else on the margin. So I actually prefer Above and Below as a game, um, and I don't think the, the narrative and adventure components of Near and Far are strong enough to, uphold, to, to counter the relative gameplay weakness because it's trying to get you to unlock those things uh, so aggressively. Yeah, but but even even aside from that, is it a game that you would consider an adventure game? Because I think it's one that wants to be, and I, one I, that I think most people would consider to be, but one that I don't think actually meets my criteria. I don't think 
I mean, I think they're clearly trying to be adventure games. I don't think they're particularly successful. I, I think I would consider Near and Far an adventure game. I don't think I would consider Above and Below an adventure game. Above and Below is a lot more about like building your your town and like the buildings and stuff, uh, where I feel like Near and Far is about like the character development and plotting out you know where you're going to go. It's not... I, I agree that it's not uh, hugely successful at what it's doing, but I, I think it does a better job of being adventure centric than above and below. Honestly, I think I, might, I get I, a, might. I get a better uh, sense of adventure out of above and below because the scenarios really? are randomized. Huh? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. That because when you decide to go on an adventure in above and below, you know that you don't have great control over it. It's something's going to happen. You know something's going to happen, but you don't know what yet. And that opening the book and reading the story, that is really the essence of adventure for, for me. It, it's, it's the feeling it gives you is one of this discovery and you don't have agency, but I, as much as you might in a more straightforward Euro where you know that you know, you go to this place and you're going to be making this exchange of resources rather than opening a story where you might, maybe you have the resource you need, maybe you don't. But the, the story that's attached to it, the, the whimsical imagery feels so much like adventure. Both of those games are, you know, have their pros and cons. Um, Above and Below really captures it for me. Um, it, yeah, and that, that, that randomizing aspect, I think is huge. The story, the imagery that comes out through through the narratives is big, but that that sense of you know something's going to happen, but you don't know what. I wish Orion was on the podcast because I would ask him right now if he likes adventure games, given that we're talking about randomization and all the things that he doesn't like. I think not to speak for him, but I think he would say he. No, I think he does. I mean, he plays. He likes to have a high amount of control, but he doesn't mind input randomness at all. I mean, mm -hmm. he plays all those grand strategy games. There's a good amount of input randomness there. Right. Um, but he also has a ton of control over them. Um, so I don't think I don't think those are necessarily opposed. I think that, that high input randomness is, is a big part of, of adventure. Yeah, and although to be clear, in all the in the examples we're talking about, we're talking about output randomness. So just to, just to be clear, okay. right? In input randomness is when there's a random thing and then your choice is reacting to that thing. Output is when you make a choice and then the result is randomized. So in above and below, it's kind of two steps of randomness. So you have a bit of both, right? You choose to go in the adventure within okay. the story. You have a choice there that's slightly randomized in near and far it's a similar thing you choose to go down the path and hit the the story spot um and then there's some kind of like a choose your own adventure style decision uh once you get there and in space corp it's it's pretty much output randomness because you choose the type of planet you're or, or not planet but the type of space you're going to but and you know generally what could be underneath it, but I mean, what the tile is 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 random. It's completely randomized within the set of those tiles. One thing before I forget and lose my train of thought. One thing I was thinking about with this topic is that there's almost a sense of adventure inherent in any game when you're discovering and figuring out what the game is. Right. So you have that first play experience. And you're trying to figure out the parameters of the game, not just strictly rules, but like, what are the different strategies? What are the possible outcomes? Uh, what are the paths and avenues I can go down? And I find that process very enjoyable. And I just tend to... No, no, it is not <laughs> yeah. enjoyable. No. <laughs> I think I'm with you, Amber. That's not, not something I enjoy either. Well, and there tends to come a point in, for me in a game where once I've played it enough and I kind of know the boundaries of that game. So I know like the limitations of what is possible with the game strategically. And I always get a little bit sad when I reach that point and I'm like, <laughs> that's the point of life. <laughs> but I mean, that's the point where you start actually becoming good at the game. Isn't that what everyone wants? 
in Mark, life th- and in this... everything? <laughs> no, everyone. Many, but not everyone. Mark, this really gets at how you play games. Because, like, of us all, you're maybe the best at just jumping into a new game and picking a strategy and rolling with it. Yeah. And I've, ha- I've had to overcome that analysis paralysis that we used to talk about where I, I'm playing a new game. And I'm like, well, if I just knew everything, then I could decide what to do. And for me, it's not even about strategies. It's about the rules. If I don't know a rule, that is the worst feeling in the world. Because then I feel like I can't play the game and I can't adventure and go out and do things. Because I, I don't know what the parameters that, are. Games that really capture adventure are games that make it easier to just experience in that way without knowing everything. I mean, yeah. I mean, just yeah. Uh, above and below, you're not mad that you don't know what challenge you're going to get when you go into the cave. Yeah, because it's inviting. It, the game is designed in a way that you're going to go on those adventures, and and it, it invites you into that. Some games don't do that. Some games, it's really frustrating that you don't know, or you flip over a tile, and it's the one thing that just you know completely screws you over. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's frustrating and maybe um, doesn't capture adventure. I don't know. What do you think about that? I really appreciate hopping onto a different game, Pandemic Legacy. I thought, you know, we all knew the base game of Pandemic, so that made it really easy for us to adjust to this new game because it was very familiar feeling. Um, but it's mm-hmm. it's so much more than Pandemic Legacy. But because you had that simple game as a starting point, that allowed for... Um, a lot more ease of transition into the larger the larger game and the the, the you know the picture it painted for you uh, and that yeah I, I felt like was maybe one of like my top three or four adventure board game experiences. See, I think I think I'm emerging in in a different space than most of you all. In that, I don't think of adventure when I think of Pandemic Legacy. I think because the narrative was so tightly confined. And I'm trying to draw a comparison to, like, when I read a book. Because adventure for me is tied to kind of these very, very specific experiences I had when I was a kid reading, like, Narnia, right? And that was such a vivid world and hinted at so much. Uh, that, you know, in terms of like getting that feeling of adventure, that's probably the number one, the number one thing for me in my entire life was when I first read the Narnia books. And I think it's because it hints at more beyond what's written on the pages to let your mind roam and go free. When I, when I think about my experiences playing Pandemic Legacy, playing Near and Far, because I know the narrative is so constrained, I can't, I don't get that same feeling until I've explored all the different possibilities on the tiles on Space Corp. Uh, I still have that. I still don't know what could pop up, right? I don't know what so- could pop up. I have specifically not looked at all the tiles before. Uh, I've probably seen most of them, uh, but just having that that element of like oh anything could happen here and i don't i know that it's not going to be anything it's going to be within a general power level or you know to make the game function but that hint of something beyond my understanding the possibility of what could be i think that really taps into what i'm thinking of as adventure having something unknown be revealed i think is definitely a part of adventure uh, and it's Maybe the most important part to me. It, it's funny that you keep going back to Space Corp, though, because I didn't feel like that was an adventure at all when I played it. But I think it was mostly just because I was trying to figure out how everything worked, and you guys kind of already knew how it, how how things were supposed to happen. I, I would definitely like to play it again at some point, but at this point, it's probably been long enough that I don't uh, I don't really remember enough about it to to have a meaningful knowledge of what's possible i think you'd i think you'd pick it up pretty quick it's 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 not that complex of a game but yeah maybe maybe i'm I'm the weird one here yeah i mean i i think i agree with ben thinking back to pandemic legacy that kind of acceptance that 
things are going to happen that I don't know now and we can't plan for, but you know, we know what we're doing now. We know, we know pandemic. We, we know the characters that we currently have. We're going to do our mission and come what may. Uh, and we know something's coming. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to roll with it. We're going to experience it. Uh, I, I, I like that as an ad- example of adventure. Mark, what are your thoughts on Archipelago? Because that has like the same discovery thing that Space Corp does with the hidden tiles. Yeah, it has the tiles, but the tiles are more. I don't. I don't know if I get quite as much of, of that feeling because the tiles are pretty limited. It's been years since I've played that game. It's what like it just determines what resource. And like, yeah, it's connected to it's water. resource and what you can do on the tile, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's not as evocative as Space Corp can be. I mean, Space Corp, you'd flip it over, at least in the, the third phase of the game, you can flip it over and discover friggin' aliens. Like, <laughs> which is wild. Yeah, Archipelago has adventure. It sounds like it's just about the theme for you. (laughs) Well, no, no, no. Archipelago has, like, adventure components, but it it does not feel like an adventure game to me because it's so, it's so tightly constrained within the board. There isn't that much variety that you can do. And it seems like the only discovery adventure parts you make are flipping over those tiles. And that's not enough. It's not enough for it to be an adventure game. Yeah, looking at the list of games I threw out on our notes, I think Robinson Crusoe is an interesting example because I mean it has some mm-hmm. tile flipping, but the the event the more adventure parts are the I can't remember what they're card called, but the cards uh, where you make a decision and you know there's some kind of consequence that's going to pop up because of that. I think because that deck of cards is so big and varied, that gives me a little bit of a sense of adventure because you never know what's going to happen when you flip over one of those cards. Um, And it tells a bit of a story, so you get a little nugget of it there. So Robinson Crusoe definitely constructs a compelling narrative to your gameplay, which is different. I'm just, I'm reacting. I don't, I don't have a, this settled in my mind, but I would say Robinson Crusoe gives a, an excellent sense of the narrative of play, feeling like you're you're progressing. But I, I don't know if I would say that it has a strong essence of adventure. I don't think it's strong. I think it's a little bit. And I wouldn't say mm-hmm. that narrative and adventure are in opposition. I think adventure is a no. subset, right? Yeah. It's a smaller bubble within the... I would disagree with that. Really? Because I see adventure in... In games, well, let me make a case for another game that I think actually does give a great sense of adventure. Um, Don't hate me. Um, (laughs) I actually think that Magic the Gathering gives a really excellent sense of adventure. Um, Playing a game of Magic is about, what, 10 minutes? Certainly if you're playing online. But a couple things that it does. First of all, the... The art and like pure theming elements are phenomenal if, if you're into that. Um, and I and, it, and, it, and it's enhanced by the fact that like I always follow spoil, spoiler season. So I'm kind of discovering the art in, in random tribes and uh, as it's being revealed. And that's completely irrelevant to the actual gameplay, which you, you could say is a fault. Well, well, it's mostly irrelevant. Um, But it does give me a sense of adventure. And then when I'm actually playing a game of Magic, it's only 10 minutes. The way that your deck works where there's, you know what's in your deck, but there's a ton of variance of what you flip over. So every turn is that little bit of, am I going to draw the thing I need? I know what's in my deck, but am I going to draw it? For a game that only lasts 10 minutes, I I, I would call that an effective sense of adventure. There's not there's not much narrative to a game of magic. You know, I think you're you're spellcasters and you know you're summoning things to, to fight for you, but the game's too short and it, it doesn't give you a a real sense of progression over time, I think. But I think it, it does evoke a sense of adventure. I could not disagree more, Matt. <laughs> In fact, huh. I will I will state the absolute opposite. 
for me, playing a game of Magic of the Gathering is a narrative, and it's a narrative between different archetypes uh, and this kind of race between them uh, that has levels of push-pull and then, at a certain point, an inevitable defeat by one side. So it has, in very abstract sense, this kind of, like, narrative arc. But I can totally see why keeping up with, like, all the story lore stuff with Magic is cool and adventuresome, but uh, a game of it... No, it's it's just all numbers and like this momentum, <laughs> sense of momentum one way or another, and knowing, you know, that if I'm playing a fast deck, I gotta hit a point within a couple turns yeah, where I win, and, and or I think, they're gonna overwhelm me. You or... can certainly play any game with varying levels of I can't think of the words like pure objectivity. You can play Magic. You can cover up the art and play it as a pure numbers game, and I think a lot of people do that. But I think it that that's different from not being effective at evoking just the components themselves, the artwork that that you're that's in front of you. That's what gives me a sense of adventure. The flipping it over, you know, am I going to draw my knight or am I going to draw, you know, this this land that I desperately need to cast my spells? That feels more adventure to me. Narrative to me has more of a sense of well, I, I guess I see what you're saying with narrative. To, to me, magic's too short to really give a satisfying narrative. It's like a one one to two beat narrative, right? It's either someone mm -hmm. comes out sure. ahead yeah. and they win, or they come out ahead and then the other player manages to hold them off and overwhelm them. Which but, is but then kind that's of how. Probably the, the or they sit there is, both is... simmering, waiting for someone to bust out a combo and then they win. Yeah, but I think I think this is the key difference in how we're looking at narrative, or sorry, adventure. For me, it's just something that's evoked. It's not. It's it's less tied to the actual gameplay. I think than than a lot of concepts we would think about. Oh, I get that. I just there's nothing about magic that keeps me tied into the world. Like I don't. Keep, while I'm playing. Outside of playing, sure, there's lots of really cool tidbits, but I'm not looking at, like, the theming of any particular card while I'm playing. I'm just thinking about it in terms of, like... Oh, well, sure. I mean, that's on you, I and guess. I th well, no, but I think I, the I game mean, encourages it just by the type thing. of game that it is. Um, and I think the big the big problem there is that magic is so, so scattershot with its worlds. Like it has so many multiple worlds and your, your decks. Yeah, but you don't have to think about that. I mean, well, I'm saying like in terms of creating a better, better either narrative or adventure, I think a game of Netrunner is actually much better at that because the world is so much more tightly constrained. Like it's all the same world with the same characters that reappear all over yeah, well, the place. Magic right. I, I would say the exact opposite. I would say Netrunner gives an excellent sense of, of narrative because, because there is such a tight um, mechanical connection to the, you know, the, the theming, but well, I didn't play nearly as much Netrunner as you did, but there's less discovery. Well, I, I, I can't speak. Network, Netrunner, I guess. I don't know. I, I just don't find the flipping over of a card in Magic to be adventure. It's more. It's the variance that I think the variance is 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 the key point there. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, it, it, this is all more subjective than our normal topic, so I'm not going to yeah definitely say that you're wrong. <laughs> it's just that I just have a very different experience. I know. I know. Well, Wes well, right, is more right. like you. Wes right. gets a Magic lot up. of evocation out of playing Magic. We discussed once in college, actually, and I was like, it blew my mind. He he's picturing like the whole battlefield with these giant monsters and spellcasters and stuff, and I'm like, yeah, I don't think about that at all. <laughs> I'm interested to hear more examples. What are, what are other examples, and and why games? So this was one that's not on your list. Um, at least I don't think it was. But um, the Arkham series, uh, Arkham Horror, Elder Horror. Yeah, let me put decent games on my list or better. <laughs> Burn. Uh, oh, man. I, I won't tell the Wilhelms that you called Arkham terrible. Um, but, like, they've they've played probably hundreds of hours by now of Arkham, and they have, like, this headcanon of, like, all the characters, what, what the characters usually do, and, like, they've really kind of uh, turned it into their own little uh, experience that's a little... 
even outside the game uh and like but the the game is has maybe provided a platform for them to have their own experiences even though it's yeah it's not the best game i i kind of relate that to the way that we played descent where we just were able to you know have fun with it and create our own story um that was you know augmenting the story that already exists yeah let me let me pause it to you i mean not to talk a lot about arkham or eldritch horror because it's i haven't played them much and it's been a couple years since i last played eldritch but I would categorize those games, Descent, kind of... Uh, no, I think Gloomhaven's a bit better at adventure, just a hair. Uh, those games, Descent and Spirit Island, as games that ha- have a high amount of narrative and a low amount of adventure. Cool. Hmm. Yeah, I don't agree. But... Yeah. I feel like like we in need Spirit Island, more... like the narrative of like the, the push and pull and the waves of enemy forces and their different strategies, where they're going, the way your spirits are building up and morphing and changing. Like, there's so much sure. narrative in that game. But I don't ever feel a sense of adventure when playing Spirit Island. Yeah. But no, I definitely Spirit agree Island. there. There's is, a bit different the, than the games like Descent, most... though. I am confused why those are looped in together in the same set. Well, Descent, I never felt like I was actually traveling... Yeah. But, I mean, I would say that, like the Arkham games, the sense of adventure is the is the strongest point about the game. Is the kind of like just kind of going around and things are going to happen to me, and like from a pure you know story perspective, that's yeah the strongest thing that it has. To to me, that's that's adventure. that's a fair point. It, I may have unfairly lumped those games. I do think Descent didn't have a sense of adventure. I thought it did. Agreed. And it's probably one of the games I think probably has the one of the bigger senses of adventure that I've played. In what sense? Where did you get that sense? You have this world with unknown rooms and unknown paths that you're discovering. Your character is developing. You get to take actions. No one else is controlling you. Uh, and the game kind of rewards some big bold actions and some creativity. So like everything that I've defined as an adventure game, it seems to have. Um, I think it was a little bit too close to be the perfect adventure game because choices end up did being more limited than I would probably like, but it felt like we were on an adventure and I got personal adventure satisfaction from that game. Interesting. I saw it as some weak connective tissue between very specific gameplay scenarios, and then we just tried to math out uh, the scenarios as best we could. Well, you guys tried to math out the scenarios way too much. By math out, we mean we we kind of spammed our best attacks over and over. (laughs) Yeah. I got really, I got kind of annoyed with that. (laughs) It was still fun to play with you guys. But well, I think that, that's we not had what I was too. doing. We had like the the forward backflips and the. <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> that attack was very good. Yeah, we tried to do I, it I as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, I think this sense of, for example, of an adventure because yeah, like the actual actual playing that nothing was revealed or very little was was hidden and re- revealed. It was so much math. And and the game forced you into that. And, and like, Amber, you were playing how we all wanted to play, but the game just pushed us so far away from that. I get it. I get it. I don't think it's the perfect example of an adventure game, but personally, it's, it's one of the games that gave me that sense of adventure. I don't think that there are a whole lot of games that do adventure well. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know if I'll hold one up as a prime example. I like the adventure components in games, though, and I want more. So I want yeah, someone to make absolutely. a game for me. That's an adventure game. Well, that's, that's a good that's a good place to pivot to kind of the next topic here, which is what are the mechanisms or gameplay aspects that best evoke adventure? Like if we were to try to conceive of the most adventurous board game. How would we build it? What are the aspects that we would build? I think we have like tile reveal or exploration is a clear 
one you would have you would want to have yeah um however you want to implement that you travel you go geographically a distance and you uncover new things uh but that obviously that by itself doesn't create adventure uh, what other aspects would you have? And, and just to point out also a, a note that obviously the the primary barrier in, in challenge with board gaming is that you have all the components, right? Video games can do adventure great because they can hide everything behind code. Uh, in a board game, yeah. you literally have all the pieces. So there's not a lot you can hide. Um, I will say let's let's look at this thought experiment first without including like app integration yeah and then we can talk about app integration because that's a clear way to overcome that challenge but i want to see what we can do without uh that that crutch uh so we have exploration what else would we want to include in this adventure game i may not have the correct vocabulary for explaining some of these mechanisms i'll translate for you yes translate um it, but I think they need a high degree of agency where not all of the players are thinking about and doing everything the same way. So it's not just a mathematical calculation. Um, so it re- it could have rewards for someone not taking an optimal mathematically calculated path. Well, that like, just changes the math, Amber. But how do you hide the math? Like I know sure, you're yeah, saying yeah. there's no apps, but there well, you should... hide it with some. I, I, I think a high degree of variance is is maybe the number one essential thing. And yeah, and, and, and honestly, this was something I was going to say earlier. I'm not sure that an adventure is actually something I look for in board games. You know, we have some examples where it's nice that we we get strong adventure, but um, but yeah, I think that that sense of or that variance of you don't know what's going to happen and as a result of that you feel like you have more agency to do things how you want to do them because Mm -hmm. the game is encouraging you not to think about optimizing perhaps yeah and that actually leads to i was going to hold this off but this seems like a good way to introduce it i and this is my little pet game mechanism that i really would like to explore uh, personally in a design, but the idea of having independent win conditions, I think is super cool for this okay. because then you get outside of the boundary of cooperative where you feel beholden to do well for your teammates or competitive where you, everything's just comes to a single winner, uh, versus a bunch of losers. Um, and if you want to encourage like expression and exploration and kind of pursuing story rather than optimization, you have to literally disincentivize optimization yeah. uh, by not having a single winner. And I think Fog of Love did all kinds of interesting things. I'm hoping the most influential aspect of that game uh, going forward is how it has not only do does each person have an independent win condition, so you could have both lose one lose one win or both win but those win conditions can change during the game and i think that's awesome and i would love to see that in a more story type game where you you know if if you go with like a stereotypical like fantasy adventure right you you start off on your journey with a certain goal maybe you know you drew the goal of amassing lots of wealth and that's your personal independent goal uh, but that certain big story moments can actually cause you to reevaluate and change that goal into something else i think that could create adventure a sense of adventure in a board game um, and i really hope more games start fiddling with this idea of independent and changeable win conditions. Yeah, that is super exciting to me. I would love to play more games like that. I don't think they really exist, but yeah. I'd love I don't to know play of them. Any, I don't know I of would, any outside of Fog of Love off the top of my head. I would say Gloomhaven has a lot of that. Um, it's not a win condition per se, but you're incentivized. You have, like, um, at the beginning of each mission, you have those... Oh, yeah, it has the uh, mission-specific your goals. ones. And then you have your character achieve like your you know long term character goal, and you're not like it is a co op game, but 
those are reasons not to play cooperatively because you have, you know, this thing that you personally want to do. Yeah, I, I would want it to be a bit stronger there because in Gloomhaven, it's not like, I guess it, it leaves it up to you to interpret how strongly you want those to influence your actions, which I, yeah, I suppose that is close to what I'm talking about. Um, I, I think that Gloomhaven suffers in this regard because um, it is so mechanically excellent and there is like an optimization puzzle of, of along the way just to, to play well. How, whatever the your short and long-term goals for the particular mission, um, that kind of optimization, I think... Get, um, yeah, detracts from the the, the, the sense of, of yeah. I think the change I would make is that the where Gloomhaven falls short is that the desire to not have to repeat the mission you're on <laughs> is so <laughs> overwhelming that it overcomes everything else, right? It's yeah. like, oh, we don't want to lose and have to play this again to move on with the story. Uh, where I think Gloomhaven could improve on that is if you had. Uh, loss conditions that actually had story impacts rather than you have to repeat this. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I don't know that that would change how you play that much. Like, I don't know that you'd be more likely to go off on like your own personal goal because you, know, you I didn't. Think have I would to play on the margin. Game. Yeah, maybe. If you knew you could still win at the end, because assuming you lose a bunch of things. Well, what is winning? What is losing? Win. Like in Gloomhaven, you don't win; you retire. Right, your your ultimate character yeah. goal just means that you choose a different character. So that's all. I think kind of a is, is too is too mechanically tight to really ask that question, Mark. I think a game like Fog of Love, which uh, clearly is an outlier, but even like there are points in that game where you don't know what goal you're gonna go for. You don't know uh, <laughs> how your life's gonna go, basically. And those inflection points give a sense of uh, wonder of like, I don't know what's going to happen and I'm going to figure it out, but we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I um, think the conversation too is emphasizing randomness a lot, which I think is important, but you also have to have enough knowledge of the game in the world to make meaningful choices. I just oh, want to make certainly. sure that's very, very clear to everyone on the podcast, because yeah. agency yeah. And, and being able to go out and pursue a goal, I think, is also very important in adventure games. So, yes, you have all of these inputs that are impacting you randomly and you don't know what's going to come up, but you have to be able to make good choices still. Yeah, and, yeah. and I know you all know that. I just want to make sure everyone on the podcast knows this, too. Let no one accuse okay. us of diminishing meaningful choices. Yes. <laughs> there you go. There I you wonder... go We're keeping us on brand. <laughs> there are games that um, give such a, such a strong narrative just by the, the, the play of the game. We've talked about Spirit Island before, of that sense of growing from this little weak free spirit maybe into this you know progressing into this ultimately powerful god of the forest uh, i'm making up this example but that's the sort of thing um that would happen and, and you're growing in that in your in it, it's full of meaning as you defend your your island that's a strong narrative um is there a sense that if games that have adventure encourage you to kind of write your own narrative that maybe is less connected to the the mechanics of the game? I don't think it necessarily has to be less connected to the mechanics of the game. Because I think that's what I've heard Amber saying, right? Is is she she's f like with the scent. She felt the you know, she kind of decided that this was how she was going to play it and and I don't know, she kind of wrote her own narrative in, in that regard rather than really focusing on the narrative rather than the narrative coming from playing the game as, as well as you could play the game. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, it kind of, I do think the mechanics are, are tied in with the sense of adventure. I, so going back to the early example with magic, I can't, have evocative feelings about magic because to me the mechanics don't make sense and I can't really play the game. Um, I, I'd have to really get into it. 
And so it, it, total separation doesn't work for me either. That's how I see magic, total separation. It, the actions that I take within the game need to make sense within the story and within the narrative. So Descent isn't a perfect example. Obviously, I did go along with your guys' optimal uh, calculations a lot of the time. Um, okay, calculations is very <laughs> stretching it, right? It's just some odds tables. It wasn't that complicated. I know, I know. I went along with it most of the time. It, but I didn't feel bad about going along with it as long as I could still make some choices myself. Let me let me try to try, say what I think you're saying in a different sure, way. Sure, sure. I think what you want to avoid is the game scolding you for, like, playing wrong when you just tried to do what you thought was be fun. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think what you're looking for is... I mean, this was already said kind of at the beginning, but mm -hmm. just the freedom to be able to pursue fun things. Yes. Which ultimately, ultimately comes down to like a very basic mantra of game design, which is that you should reward the most fun parts of the game, which, you know, once you say it sounds obvious, but it's you hard, look it's a hard lot of it's hard to actually game. do yeah, it is. Uh, in a game uh, when you're designing. But I think for you, having that be very strong and also just having different strategic paths Mm -hmm. uh, available, I think, is what you're getting at, which I it's just in some sense I agree with. Yeah, having that freedom to ignore part of the game, like it just makes the game seem bigger, I suppose. Yeah, and I think I'm very reasonable in this request for all of you game designers out there. Give me a game. Well, I, like. I mean, you're asking for a you know a big, <laughs> difficult to design. It's game. hard. Yeah. It's it's really hard. When I try to think how I would design these things in my mind, I don't have an answer. I can't come up with anything that's particularly good. We should, we should good. try to do it, Amber. We should. I have the bones yeah. of something based on a little bit of what I've talked about. But yeah. We should try to pursue that at some point yeah. after our pepper game. Well, I want to incorporate some of these elements in that too. Oh, of course. But sure. that was also hard. We're kind of at a standstill with. Yeah, we got to jump back into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So going back to this hypothetical game, right? We have exploration and discovery. We have kind of agency and independence in terms of what is victory, what is uh, fulfillment for your character, your avatar. Is there anything else? Any other mechanical things or gameplay aspects that you th you all would 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 think would tap into adventure i think that the the artwork and theming is actually incredibly important for this I do discussion too. yeah I do, do we too. think it almost needs to be fantasy no, no i don't i think you could build a good adventure game in, it, themed in an existing city in the united states and it would still be fun a historical game would also be fun. I don't think it needs to be imaginary or fantasy. I like imaginary and fantasy stuff, um, and I think it, it's almost easier, but I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, that makes sense. I said that, and then I started doubting myself, and then you confirmed my doubts. <laughs> but I agree, it's hard, with, I agree with Matt. I think you need to have art and, and production that evokes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I don't think you need to. Well, in some sense, you do. I think it really helps. It does. <laughs> it does help, but I think also the kind of like overly complex art that seems to result from that sentiment often doesn't evoke. Well, like I think the art for the Arkham, like Fantasy Flight Arkham games, is horrific. I think it's ugly and dour and doesn't evoke any horror or interest or fantasticalness. But that's kind of where a lot of these games seem to go. Um, and maybe I'm just in the minority. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I think, think in terms think... of evoking a setting, something like Pax Pamir, I think, does way better than Arkham Horror. Yeah, but I don't think adventure is just about evoking a setting. I think I'm not. I'm not sure what it's about, but like, well, in, well, to give an example, uh, to prove your point here, let's think of a game that has incredibly evocative artwork and completely fails in its sense of adventure, and that's Scythe. Yeah. Definitely. That evokes a setting super well, and then no adventure. It's a, just a different type of game. So I think, yeah, art art and production is probably good and helpful, uh, but certainly not, I don't think, necessary and not... Uh, 
I'm not, I think certainly it, not by itself. I, I think uh, I'm with I'm sufficient. with Matt where saying, it's almost necessary. I think we're saying it's necessary but not sufficient. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because I had had Scythe not had all the production value and all all that beautiful artwork on the box. I don't think we would even have considered that it was a failed adventure game. <laughs> I I, I, I think it yeah. wouldn't even have been in the conversation. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the it would games. have been. A, I suppose I'm 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 pushing up against the kind of the not that the art isn't necessary, but that oftentimes in the board game world that tends to reach this kind of the style of art that I think doesn't always work very well. I mean I think Space Corp, you know, it's not super fancy art, but I think it does well to to evoke like the vastness of space and the scope of the game. Well, maybe we need a bigger survey group than just us on that, because clearly the publishers are doing this style of art for a reason. So is it their fault, or do people actually like it, and I does think, it evoke that sense? I think it's easy to do, and they're maybe not imaginative enough in some cases. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much is perceived expectations versus actual demand from people, but uh, I get a bit tired of it. I mean, Spirit Island is, I, I would say, has an art style that is a bit unorthodox for that style of game. It's But it's got still some what you would expect. Anyways, any final comments from you all? This is kind of exhausted what I was thinking about with adventure, but anything else that has come to mind for you all in terms of adventure and board gaming? Um, I wanted to, to just throw out that there are games like Galaxy Trucker, where <laughs> I would normally consider it an adventure game, but I think the important thing that it's lacking is the action aspect during the actual adventure. Because setting up the ship is not adventure. Then you send your ship off onto an adventure, but you're not part of that. You just watch it fall apart. So there are adventure aspects in that game, but I don't like that I'm not participating in the adventure part of it. I mean, yeah, you make yeah. some choices, but they're, they're quite limited. Yeah. So I, just another emphasis that I think choice and agency and active gameplay is an important part of advent an adventure game rather than just story and theme and random things happening. Yeah. And w what I almost forgot was uh, app implementation. So if we allow a bit of digital implementation into a game, which has been done, though we haven't played with much of it, so this is more speculation than normal, but do you all think that would make a significant difference in terms of, we talked about like the difference between rolling dice and flipping over a, a tile, is putting an input into your phone and getting something from the void even more adventuresome, you think? I don't know. I would, I kind of want to see more experiments with this, um, but I'm, I'm not convinced that it's actually that different. Yeah, I'm not sure how I would react to it. Yeah. I like the idea of yeah. app games being collaborative and people being able to play app games, but the integration with board games to me has always seemed a bit odd. So I think board games should be their own thing, and then we should be developing more app games uh, that there are their yeah. own thing. And you, I think that that is very conducive to adventure, but I don't think they're going to operate like board games. Yeah, I like, could see not, some not really weird mishmash and... in the future where like everyone like brings their tablet or something, and you all play like a, some sort of a board game together. On your tablets. But like, that could be... I'm sure that, that exists. But I don't really see everyone yeah. coming together for that. Once you put it on the tablet... But it, I'm talking about this, the, the kinds of games where the the app takes the place of a big deck of right. cards. Yeah, yeah, where it's, ta where it's uh, a new mechanic. I think it gives you more tools, for sure. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very flexible tool. I mean, and it allows you to do more connected story beats more easily, uh, more complex story beats more easily. And so in that sense, I think I think it would come down to how much you trust that the app isn't railroading you, that it's actually giving you <laughs> real story choices. Yeah. And maybe if you were 
if you if you establish that trust, it, that maybe that's the best way of doing it, of, of doing these kind of adventure stories that can go off into all kinds of different areas because you can create larger trees. Yeah, it seems to me like with regards to adventure, app integration might be like an incremental improvement over something like the booklet in Above and Below. But, but it's why? hard hard for me to see it like really bringing a, a completely new sense of adventure that we haven't seen before in in a board game. I don't think this is conducive to board games at all. So if you move that much of the story and that much of the cards essentially onto an app, why do we even have a board anymore? Why are we around a table? It feels like a different kind of style of game. One that I like and would be excited about, but... At the point where you're really doing something new and exciting on the app, you're kind of moving away from the board game. Yeah. Yeah, but I think in terms of if you're just like so if you have like like with the the Robinson Crusoe's sequel did this right instead of having that big old stack of 100 cards or whatever uh it had an app and I, I haven't played it it was apparently not received well because of the rule book I think uh but I think I don't know if it's just a straight replacement for the deck of cards it's probably not better if you are able to weave a more elaborate super branching story from it that genuinely feels open and explorative then then maybe that works really well there was a pirate game i got to take a peek at at pax unplugged last pax unplugged uh that did some interesting stuff in terms of story i don't know how i i, I remember walking away feeling a bit disappointed in how many different stories they had because it's like well that could have just been written out like it didn't feel like they're using the benefit of the app to its greatest potential but i don't know i i suppose i'm mildly skeptical but i i see the potential there where you can you know if you dedicate yourself to actually a lot of story writing you could do something pretty cool uh, with Apple implementation in terms of generating story and and in all kinds of that sense of not being able to see the limits, right? Getting past that, okay, we know, I know I've seen 80% of the cards in this game. Like, what's the other 20% going to do in terms of surprise? Like, getting rid of that has the potential to, to be special, I think. But question, is it still a board game at that point? If it's all board game except for one aspect, yeah, I think so. If the rest is board game. I'm I'm not convinced that this works together. But I guess we'll have to see, because I think it is something that we will start seeing more of in games. Well, I, we have seen quite a bit of it. We just don't own any of these games. True. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Like, I, I know I've played, like, maybe one game that had an app as, a, like, an integral part of the game. Uh, was that like Alchemist or something? Well, that was um, just to hide some information. Yeah. Well, yeah. Which honestly was a really cool Apple implementation, but not, it was, uh, we should just call them Applements. Applements. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Applementation. That, that was to, yeah, that was just to hide some info. It wasn't story related. It was a de- deduction game. Uh, but I know that, I know the new mansions of madness does this, um, there's now apps for Descent and Imperial Assault that handle the AI, which is a different thing than what we're talking about, so you don't have to have one. You can be fully cooperative. There's a fantasy flight game. I believe it was a fantasy f- flight game called Legacy of Dragonholt, which I believe did app did app Im- implementation. I don't know. I can't see it on the BGG page, but uh, I believe it had that. Or maybe it had a big old fat storybook. I know it, I know people are praising the story. There's a few other examples that are, are notable and a, a number of minor examples, I think. Uh, so we're seeing it. We just don't necessarily have those games yet. Uh, but I think I haven't heard of a game that has taken it to the levels that I'm imagining in terms of a really in-depth story. And I think it's just a matter so, of time yeah. before we, we see that. Yeah, I think my sense of adventure is mostly something that's well, it's it's more nebulous than a lot of ways that, that I talk about board games. 
And it's something that that's evoked in a way that I don't know that kind of this this more complex narrative would really make a huge difference. I mean, that, that's something that'd be really cool. And I think, yeah, would would really, I don't know, would bring interesting experiences, narrative to, to board game. It doesn't feel like a huge, huge advance. Uh, advancement well, I'm, I'm seeing it not necessarily, not necessarily that it's super complex story, but it's that you get you get that feeling that whatever you do, the game yeah. has something for you, right? Yeah. That sense that you can't find the edges, like you can't find the limits of where the game has has planned for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, in, in video games, again, is much easier to evoke. But even in, like, big exploration-style video games, you end up reaching that point where you're like, okay, now I'm just grinding. There's always that point where you get past it, the immersion and into the grind. But, I don't know, I think board games can push it back a bit more. Well, I think that'll do it for today's podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you can think of any good examples for adventure or games that are doing the kind of thing we're speculating about. Go ahead and leave that in the comments. Uh, don't forget to check out the thoughtfulgamer.com uh, for all thoughtful gamer stuff, podcast writing, uh, and more. You can find me on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer, where you'll get access to all kinds of good stuff, including watching our podcast being recorded live. Uh, which we got some people watching today, I think. A couple people popped in, which is fun. Again, that is patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.